Good evening, everyone. I hope that you have had a great week so far and that you have been enjoying the live sessions that we've been having uh, till date. And I hope that you're going to enjoy today's session. I'm going to be uh, chatting with Ola uh, on the importance of retail formats and tiny and little spaces. Small spaces or even tiny spaces are being more than uh, ever present on the retail scene and we are seeing more and more uh, creative types of retail formats, small versions of retail formats that are modular, transportable and that can appear in different places. So today we're going to look at these types of spaces and their importance in terms of pop-up retailing. Brands are having the urge today to explore new spaces and new retail channels. And there are many possibilities being offered to them by many contractors or uh, many uh, types of uh, retail designers. Today we're going to look at one of these examples. So. Uh, if a brand wants to explore a new place or wants to explore a new uh, retail format or extend its existing formats, it might not only uh, go to traditional shops or for storefronts, maybe it would like to complete its online uh, retail channel with offline retail versions that are smaller, more adaptable and that could meet their client needs in different locations and different spaces. So I'm going to um, wait for Ola to be connected before discussing uh, all of these things. And I hope that you have been enjoying the latest sessions that we have been doing. Uh, I mean to present to you with uh, a greater and a bigger picture related to pop-up stores because today the pop-up retail uh, scene is being uh, busy more than ever. There are not only uh, platforms that just provide brands with empty spaces, there are many services being offered to uh, brands who wish to engage in pop-up retail. For example, uh, services related to events or maybe services related to furniture or even uh, services related to social media management and communications. But today, again, I'm going to, uh, here is Ola, I'm going to, to chit chat with Ola about tiny spaces and we're going to see how important they are in uh, the pop-up retail scene. I'm waiting for us to connect, to be online, hoping that internet connections help us. <laughs> Hi there. Hi. How are you? Ola, could you try to flip on the camera to the portrait, to the portrait side, yes. Thank you everyone for joining us and we hope to be able to answer all of your questions today. And if you could also flip another 180 degrees to be able to see you better. Yes, perfect. One second. Yeah. I think I'm having tech difficulties. Yes, <laughs> no worries. Thank you Ola for joining me. Yes, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. A pleasure. We're very interested in knowing more about the business and about the services that you offer. So can you explain to us what do you do exactly? What does Thin Spaces, Tiny Spaces consist of? So Thin Spaces basically, is, uh, we focus basically on using our containers to support uh, conventional Structured. So what we try to do is uh, provide spaces for people where conventional structures will not work. So in terms of this, you will look at it as a pop-up. So uh, uh, 
let's take uh, let's take an example. Uh, in a car park, cars are normally parked there. But then you find out that you get a lot of footfall in the car park. So that's a good place to put something to sell, you know, something to, you know, that's, that's basically the idea. So we're looking at places where conventionally you wouldn't put, you wouldn't put a, a retail space, you wouldn't put a store there. But then these spaces are viable spaces which people would go to, willingly buy, but then they don't have those services provided in those areas because typically to everyone, we're supposed to have uh, shops in a shopping mall or in a, or in a shopping district or, or something else. So we're looking for alternative spaces. We're looking for alternative views that we can pair up together and provide a service to a client in a space where it wouldn't have ordinarily existed. Great. So you're looking at new customer needs and new retailer needs. You're trying to find unconventional spaces where normally a traditional retail format wouldn't exist. And you're helping retailers represent their brands in spaces that you are providing, right? So how do you, yes. uh, how do you conceptualize the design of these 10 tiny spaces? So we, we, we draw our inspiration from a whole bunch of places. Uh, in uh, the way I look at life, there's, there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, it, it's all out there. You can learn so much by taking in uh, so much. So, you know, and then, you know, making it yours. So that's basically what we do. We go out there. We look at things that we like. We look at not regular structures. I look at a regular structure. I look, how can I turn this into a container structure? I look at the edges. I look at... Oh, can I can I put a square in there and make and make it a container? Because if I look at a container, I can just say, oh, this structure is a two-bedroom structure. I can use three containers just by looking at it, by turning everything into a container structure. Just by turning everything modular, we uh, we basically can design from that space. So what we do is we draw inspiration from what we see from day-to-day -day life. Our structures are modular. You know, we have predetermined. Um, uh, dimensions for our containers. So uh, we are restricted by what we can do with them, but then they are also very, very versatile. So uh, what we do is we draw inspiration from out there, and then we, we work just in line with every architectural standard or engineering standard to make sure that we can put out a drawing or design for a client that they will be happy with. Okay, let's talk about uh, the structure then. So uh, we are limited to the space of the container. However, a modular structure can be uh, made of several containers uh, fit into each other, right? Yes. And uh, when we have the container and when it's ready, will it be fully equipped with everything that helps the retailer uh, make the business operational in that space? electricity, uh, connection, evacuation, everything will be ready in that space? Yes. So basically what we try to do, what we try to provide to our clients is a plug and play system. So basically we would, we would take a design, we will build it. If it's a singular structure that's easily movable, or even a complex structure, we will build it and prefabricate all those things into it. The electrical, the plumbing, the, you know, the insulation, the flooring, the windows, and then deliver those to site as a, as a complete unit. Now, that works well for places like, or structures like kitchens, like, you know, little stores or general store in a single container. You can build these off-site at a different location controlled location and then deliver, deliver them to site. Now, this, this helps with a lot of convenience. You know, the client doesn't have to have you on their site, you know, with your workers, you know, build a nuisance, you get what I'm saying? So basically the, the idea about it is you can make the client literally buy a house. You can make them buy a space where you can now come and then just install it onto their space with uh, minimal, minimal uh, disruption to their to day-to-day their -day life. And Ola, you, you mentioned earlier that these structures are modular, which means that if uh, a retailer or a brand uh, uses this space today in a parking lot, could he move the space and uh, put it in another location? Yes, yes. This is, a, this, is a core this is something that we hold very core. 
uh, because we, we tend to look at container spaces. Government tends to look at container spaces as temporary structures. Um, once, you start to, once you start to build uh, maybe over four or five containers and you start to put them all together, then you're looking at a more permanent structure. But then we build in mind to make sure that, you know, whatever the client wants to use the space for 10 years down the line, five years down the line, that structure is movable. Now, uh, the complexity in that is where we would already address this. We would address this at the own stage. What are you going to do two years down the line? What are you going to do three years down the line? We want to future view. We want to future plan to make sure that there are no problems later on down the line. So if the structure was one container, then we can turn it into two containers in five years' time. Then we can turn it into four containers in ten years' time if the person needed more space. Uh, but if the person wanted the entire unit off the space, you could literally move the units off the space and retain everything in the unit with minimal damage. Now, this is all part of how we build and construct the unit. Now, there are some units where if you cut them together, it, it will be difficult to, to not lose something. You will lose a bit and bits and bits there. You will lose maybe some, some cracks on the POP, but, but, but you will keep the, the main structure, which is, the, which is the core of the build. And you can literally take it somewhere else, drop it somewhere else, and then just uh, retrofit again, or just, uh, how would I put that word, uh, just kick it up just slightly to make sure that everything fits back into, into place. Perfect. So uh, let's talk about uh, the, the possible brands who could uh, be interested in this type of service. So we said earlier that it might be a restaurant or a general store. Uh, when designing these spaces, would you go and propose your service to the brand or does the brand generally come and approach you with a service a requirement or a need? So basically, the, the, we, we already see that the brand already has a problem. They are either looking to expand their reach, uh, go into new locations, or they're trying to start a new store. You know, they, it might be new, new people, people that are just starting fresh. They're looking at it as an option. Some people might not be able to afford a space in a shopping mall. Some people might not be able to afford a space on a, on a, on a high-traffic road or on a high street. Now, these people are looking at doesn't mean they don't have the money, but they just don't see the, the, the connection between having such a high, high overhead cost. Now, they want something different. Now, these are the type of clientele that, like I said, they might be starting off straight. They might be starting off fresh. Or they might be just trying to increase what they already have. Now, they come to us with what they want. We suggest to them, based on what the unit can do, and try and expose to them. And it's basically like a hand, hand holding exercise where we tell you this is what the unit is capable of, these are the pros, these are the cons, how would you like it? And then they tell us based on, of course, maybe a picture they've seen somewhere, they tell us, oh, this is how I like it, this is how I want it, I want this amount of space. So we take a brief, just like any architectural firm would, and then we would interpret that brief, you know, and the drawing, and of course share that with the client. Once the client agrees, and then we can now move forward with, uh, with the construction. Okay, depending of course on the complexity of the project and the design, but in average, how much time uh, would you need to conceive a space? Sorry, could you come over that again? Oh no, I'm going to repeat. I wanted to ask, how much time, in average, do you need to build a container space? Oh, this is where this is where the advantages come. It, it does take considerably less time than a conventional view. So if we're talking about a single container, a 24 container, you know, used as a as a top shop or a general store now, those could be ready in about two to three weeks. Two to three weeks for a single store, 40 foot unit, they could be ready in about three to four weeks. Now this is also depending on uh, various factors. But within that time, typically, we can get these units out. Now, the more complex the build, of course, the more time frame we would have to look at. But for, for a unit where I am making a single design and I'm multiplying or, more, or duplicating those, then we can, we, can, we, can, we can achieve those in three weeks, basically. So uh, our minimum time for a structure of, of uh, how would I put this, of two-bedroom house. 
could be done in as little as eight weeks. Okay. In as little as eight weeks. So it's really like projects that can be hands-on, handy, and would help the customer directly get into business uh, if he's looking at that channel. Uh, from the clients that you have been serving lately, uh, do you think that uh, this structure could serve them as an additional uh, retail space or would it generally be it's their only retail space? Yes, it, it, it serves both ways. We, we've seen this work both ways. We've seen new customers come on board. They've never had a space before. They've never had a store before. But then they want a container store because they think it's different. It might differentiate their brand. And these are the things that uh, a client looks for. How does, how does investing in this make me look? Or how does it make my brand look? Now, we've, seen, we've seen people from different ends of the spectrum, from companies to uh, to, to individuals looking to, just like I said, uh, reach more, put more out there, try and uh, be different. Now, in the times that we're in, you, you, really, you really need to be, to be that right now. You need to be different. You really need to yeah. stand out. Uh, quite a lot of things are, are no more, in a sense. Quite a lot of jobs are no more. And uh, you, need to, you need to say, hey, within all this noise, especially all that noise now has gone onto the Internet or onto social media, and everyone's vying for, how will I put it, supremacy in a sense. You need to say, I can stand out. Now, the container structures, the container structures also help in the sense that you can now create a space where you don't have to incur the overhead. Now, we're looking at this in terms of business. You don't have to incur the overhead. You can just put your, your core functional spaces into a container, put that somewhere, where you don't have to pay so much rent, and then you know, shut down your main structure, where you're going to be incurring so much, and but then still be able to to provide services. Now, for business continuity purposes, this is this is massive. You wouldn't need to go open up a new building or a new structure. You can take your core staff, put your core equipment in a container, make it nice, and still provide those services that you would provide. A lot of businesses have had to shut down or or really really slow down or ramp down what they're doing. Just because, you know, in terms of business continuity, uh, many people don't have another space. Many people don't have an alternative space. They might have alternative structures, alternative equipment, but they don't have alternative spaces. It, it's very difficult to, to achieve that. But with a container now, you can find out that I can duplicate my business as a, as a, as a food business. I can duplicate my business. I can, I can go from being a restaurant to being a drive through Yes. With a container on the same space. You see, so if I cannot open my restaurant and have people walk in, I can put my kitchen in a container and then have them drive through. Now, these are just some of the things that we, we try to we try to look at. This situation has, has brought up some of these things, some of these opportunities, and uh, the clients have also seen that. And uh, we've seen a, a bit of an upturn to sentiment. You know, people look at containers as, it's just a box to move something. But with, with, the, with the coronavirus and everything that's gone on, you know, it, a little bit of a shift in sentiment there because people see it as viable. It can be used. You don't have to go crazy spend. And, you know, you could do something small. You can start small. You can be minimalist and still provide a service and still grow your bank. Yeah, we're, so we are looking with these spaces at uh, concepts that are uh, more efficient, even if they are simpler, but they are right there right now. They are more efficient and they can help the brand really reach uh, that um, uh, objective it has been looking at in terms of sales, in terms of presence, etc. Now today, if you heard of the, the, the trends related to retail and pop-up retail, pop-up stores have been looking massively at these types of spaces that are tiny and modular and that can help the brand move from one place to another. Uh, to another. Have you been also designing uh, places or tiny spaces that could suit a brand or fit with a brand objective to open up a pop-up space? Yes, we have. We, we, we've dealt with a few clients that require this type of, uh, this type of, uh, of, of, of build in the sense that oh, I have one client that predominantly he sells shoes online. Now, he wants a, a retail space. He wants a space where people can see him. So he comes to us and says, I don't know. I can't afford land. I can't afford land in a big space. So we, we look at suggestions for him. 
Ah, something that we oh, she's come to play. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so something. No, that's all right. Something that we look at is we will try. You know, if we see an opportunity for a client to to have a space where they couldn't normally find it or they couldn't normally they couldn't normally acquire it. We would, we would give them a, a, head, a heads up as to what they should do. So let me give you this example. We have someone that wants to sell shoes. He sells shoes predominantly online. He doesn't have a store, a, a physical store. He wants a physical store, but he cannot afford a shopping mall. He cannot afford a high street. Yeah. So we tell him, we tell him, you know what? Go talk to someone that has a smaller shopping mall. The shopping mall has a huge car park that from Monday till Saturday or Monday to Friday, there's barely anybody in there. There's no cars, no nothing. On the weekend, it's maybe 70% capacity. Now, for a container store, for you to put your space there, you will need the, 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 the car park space of one saloon car. So go over, talk to the, to the owner and say, look, give me a space for a saloon car. I would have this space here. It would not interfere with your business or compete with your business. It would, in fact, add to your add business. Yeah. But then, add value to your business, but then I would pay you rent for this space where you weren't earning anything. Now, that is a proposition for a client that you've seen that beyond that. He only sees it as a car park. He's, he's a, how will I put it? He owns a build. He sees it as a car park. But then if you tell him, like, look, in this time that we're in right now, if I tell you, I will pay you $4,000 for the space of a saloon car to put my container space there. I think every avid businessman would think, oh, this is something. Yeah, and it's a win-win. Yeah. It's a win-win. It's a sure, win-win. sure. Okay, so um, now in, in, in today's retail scene, in your opinion, and after having designed many spaces, um, what do you think makes a retail space successful? Well, I think once setting up a business, you need to... You need to know your business. You need to know the market. You need to have a good product. And, you know, use the four Ps. You know, it's terminology, but these things are unnecessary. You need to make sure that these things are, are standard before you actually open up any business. Now, with social media now and, the way, and where the world's going now, quite a few of these things are more, are more realizable. Back in the day, if you opened up a business, you couldn't advertise. You couldn't advertise anywhere. You could only advertise in newspapers, TV, and radio. This was out of reach to almost everyone. But with social media now, anyone can advertise. Now, that, that promotion in the 4P is open to everyone. Now, you can get a space, you can promote, you can have a good product, you get what I'm saying? And then, of course, you can have a good, a good location where you place that. Now, all these things coming together, all these things coming together, it's very, very difficult to do. Now, some businesses get just one right, a good product, and that's it. They fly out the zone. Some people get all four right and they still have problems. So we, we try and tell the client, what is it that you want to do? Oh, I want a juice bar. Then I'll tell you, your juice bar should look a certain way. You must have that feel of a juice bar. I will make it look like a, how will I put it, like a kiosk. I'll make it look nice. I'll make it look neat. I'll make it look clean and white. I want to see everything. I want, because it's a juice bar, this is uh, health food and stuff. Everything has to look so clean, so, so, so nice. But if I'm doing a grill, I can have it look rusty. I can have it look a bit dirty. You get what I'm saying? That, these are the type of ways. So we have these, these conversations with the clientele so that they tell us what it is that they want to do. Then we, we, we put that into the unit so that it speaks of the brand. So you try to build a coherent, actually a coherent design with the brand identity in order to have this fit between the client's needs and their products or services and how the space should be reflected. Yes. Ola, we have a little question. Someone is asking about the prime locations for a business like uh, the spaces you are offering. I mean, we talked about uh, locations that could uh, be possible options for uh, handing in uh, these types of spaces, but are there prime locations that you would suggest? Yes. Now, we, we, let's look at locations that people are not looking at, locations that will typically could help out. Now, I live in, we live in Lagos, and we have a lot of housing estates. Housing estates would be a group of houses that look, they look alike. They are, they're, they're sexual, they have security. 
joint security, joint electricity. It's like a, a little village. We have them dotted all over the state. Now, some people have to travel out, you know, long distances to go get a little bit of supplies because they just don't, they don't accommodate them in those estates. We don't want people selling in those estates. But then with a temporary structure where I'm not going to be there permanently, I could, I could, that's a different proposition. So we're looking at estates. We're looking at car parks, especially car parks, because you would have, it's a, we see it as a waste of land, because I would sit there on a Monday till Friday, and I see no one in the car park, and it's just wasted land. Prime land wasted on high traffic streets with high footfall, but nobody, nobody, nobody does anything there. So you, you do it in a way where it, it helps the business where you're, you're, you're going to try and put your space into it. It's going to support their business. I'm not going to put... If, if, if the mall sells food, I'm not going to go and propose them, I want to put a container that sells food you know, right next to you. No, I want to propose them something else that will support the food. Uh, you know, you sell packaging or something, you sell anything that supports food, that would be, that would be a better proposition. So that is how we look at it. So you look at it as car parks, estates, these places are not, are not looked at. Where you can drop a temporary structure, where you can say, I have to be here for a lead time, maybe a year or two years, and then when you're done, you would leave like you weren't there at all. So yeah. that, that's basically how. Yeah. yeah, so you're looking at really spaces that are junction uh, between a, a great flow of people or a great footfall, and but that uh, were neglected or uh, were not uh, paid attention to at some point. This is very yeah. important. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I've, I've been seeing some comments that people love your architecture and love the mobility oh. of the architecture <laughs> and how we can move the product. Really, this is a really important thing. Um, Ola, uh, many brands would maybe now be happy to uh, hear some tips that you could give them uh, in order uh, to uh, help them choose the right small spaces or that can help them design the right small spaces? Oh, I think, I, th I think, I, I don't know. I think uh, it's cut a little bit. Yeah. I'm back. Okay, perfect. So what, can, what tips can you give to architects and designers who work or would like to work with small spaces? Uh, we look at it as it's a, it's a game of space saving. You need to think further than what you're doing right now. You need to know what you want. Once you do that, then you can always fit what you want into the space that you want. It's a predetermined, predetermined uh, uh, dimension. You can't really go outside those dimensions. You need to work within those dimensions. So it, it, it creates a bit of a challenge, but then that challenge focuses you as to what's possible and what you can do with the space. The space is always expandable. You can always expand it and add more and more. But then we, we do this not, we, we keep cost in mind also because we find out that sentiment around it right now is it might be an, it's an alternative, but it's a cheaper alternative. And the, this, is, this is something we carry forward. We want to make sure that when we're dealing with a customer, we do not propose something that is overly, overly priced because containers could be, could be as expensive as, as, uh, as conventional structures. But then we try yes. our best to make sure that yes. we build local and use local equipment, local labor. In these ways, we can, we can try and reduce the cost of the, and, and create a more, a more, how would I put it, a more appealing proposal to the customer. So if the customer wants to build a structure that is about 300 square, square meters of space, if I propose that to him in a container, I would typically want it to be lesser than a 300 square meters of space with a conventional view. So that, that's number one. That already gives, that, that already allows the person to say, oh, this is a viable option because it, it might be less. It could be less. Now, the client yeah. could want more. The client can say, oh, I want this to be super luxurious. And they can afford that. They can do that. But then what, what we propose every time is we look at whatever we're doing in view of conventional structures, and we ensure that when we're quoting, it is, it is less when compared to it. 
So you're trying to start with something that is very cost efficient, and then uh, you would advise the the customer to uh, take to start with that, and maybe if you want to add more into that structure, you would be able to uh, provide it as well. Ola, we have another question. Someone yeah. is asking, how is Land Use Act in Lagos favorable to these compact spaces? Yes. Now, these, uh, these, the Land Use Act in Lagos, basically, uh, if you look at it, uh, containers are looked at as temporary structures. If you're building a single container space and you have the right to use the land or you have consent to use the land and you're going to follow building code and make sure that your structure fits in with everything else in the area, then you shouldn't have a problem with uh, the building councils on it or anyone. Now, if we look at the, the charter, the building charter for Lagos, it doesn't even, it doesn't address it as structures. They don't address containers as structures or as, as permanent structures. They address as temporary structures. So these are, so, some things might still need to change. The, the law might still need to, to change to catch up to the pace of which developers are going because, like I said, people are using these to build shopping malls. They're building big complexes. But then when it comes to getting approval to build this complex, it gets a bit difficult because the engineering terminology is different. A few things are different. Sure. And yeah. they, you know, in Lagos, in Nigeria, you know, you need to, like I said, follow or toe the line and make sure that they can, that you, can get, you can get planning permission to build your structure. So you need professionals, number one, to make sure that they give you a professional drawing. That drawing needs to be, of course, vetted by an engineer. So once you make sure that you follow all the stipulations for building code and building structures, then of course then you wouldn't no have problem. a structure. You wouldn't have a problem with. Yes. yes. Perfect. Uh, uh, the same um, person is asking also another question. Do you get these consents for customers? So I think if a client is doing a project with you, would you help them get these consents? Yes, we, we, like I said, it's a, it's a hand-holding exercise. Many customers don't know how to get the content. So, yes. of course, we have content at the building council where when we draw, of course, the client accepts the drawing and they're okay with it, then we will forward those drawings to the building council and, of mm. course, follow up on the, on the behalf. So once things move along, and it's, it's, like I said, it's, going to be a, it's going to be a communication between everyone, between yes. us, the building council, and the client. So they know what's going on at every single stage of the, of the approval process. And of course, once approval is, is given, uh, I'm sure a fee has to be paid. Once the fees are paid, then you know, things, things move a, a, a whole lot better that way. But what we do is we make sure that before we take on any job or any, any structures, we make sure that we review the land, we make sure that there is approvals in place before we actually go ahead and do any of these. Sure, is, not to have any, any negative not, surprises, sure. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Yeah. Uh, the, the person is thanking you for your answers. Uh, yeah, Ola, thanks. would you like to add any other ideas that we haven't discussed but are important uh, to uh, your business or that you would like to highlight to our listeners? Yes, yes. I just think, uh, you know, containers are, uh, I would say, corona, corona proof. They're yeah. corona proof because all, all the big structures, all the big major structures that you see out there, they, they use this now. You can't put people in there. If you, if you can't put people in there for the time being, and this thing is going to go on for a while. So I'm thinking for, for businesses looking, like I initially said, in terms of business continuity, so it's a massive step to make sure that you don't, you don't see the destruction that, that the virus has shown, or you can weather this destruction by not waiting to, for the government to say, oh, you can reopen your structures, or you can reopen buildings. You can create temporary structures, temporary offices, temporary kitchens, temporary stores that would serve your clients and, like I said, continue your business. Uh, uh, people that are serving food, especially around food, it is, it is massive. Is massive. You can do you can do takeaways from your kitchen, but some some places might not. People looking to to start freshly into food business, they might not be able to acquire space right now. But and even if they did, they wouldn't be able to realize the full uh, the full the, the full uh, 
the full, uh, how will I put it, the full impact of the customers coming in. Businesses now have to go online. But to go online, you still require a space to operate out of. Now, the container will give you that space in yeah. your backyard. A physical you know, places, legitimacy for your space, online business. In places, exactly. In places where you, would, you wouldn't normally consider to be, to be spaces, where you can have them temporarily and have them in a lease position. And when you find a better space, you can literally move your business from place to place. Yeah. Thank you. Ola, we have another question. Uh, how is the adoption level of container living in Lagos as compared to the conventional building? Yes, this is quite a new, it's a new phenomenon here. The way we build it, it's a new phenomenon. Now, container structures are best in port cities. I live in Lagos, it's a port city. We've got a port here, so we have access to containers. Now, the further away you are from port cities or uh, a city that has a port, then it, it gets a bit more expensive because you're now having to deal with increased logistics moving, or moving yeah. containers. You know? So this, there are some drawbacks. And like I said, it works really well in and around port cities. So the adoption here is it's been massive in Lagos. The structures, structures are coming up every day. More structures, more people seeing it. And like I said, it's a bit of a paradigm shift. You know, we're starting to see more a shift in sentiment towards containers. Normally people would look at it as, oh, it's just a box, so I couldn't, I couldn't put all my money and put it in a, in a, in a metal box. Uh, I would rather build with brick. We, we hear that a lot, or they yeah. don't think it's sophisticated enough. But then when, when they see a couple of structures, and you see a structure and you go into it, and you don't even know it's made of container, and then you're told it's made of container, I believe that's where we need to get to in terms of design, in terms of delivery. And I think we are getting there, and you know, we, we are putting out some, some, some designs. We are working on some designs that, that we feel would, would you know, when they, when they launch, would change the game. Yeah. yeah, sure. And I think customers are very drawn by these types of containers as they are something new, and they happen to be there when, when, when needed, actually, and that they provide concepts that are making customers happy they are convenient for them and uh, I think customers will also pull that demand from brands to to get these uh, types of uh, formats done or or they are requesting brands for these types of novel formats because they provide them with this uh, nice experience really nice um, I I don't know if you're you're still uh, listening uh, with clarity or cutting. Yeah, with clarity, I can hear you very well. Perfect. I can hear you Ola, very well. would would you like to add anything else to to our listeners? Yes, yes. I would just I would just like to say, quite a lot of people have a lot of uh, a lot of reservations now because of the way containers behave. It's a it's a metal box. In a cold climate, you know, it conducts, it conducts heat, it conducts a lot of heat energy. So a lot of people have a lot of reservations. They think about, how can I put anything in a metal box? It mm. won't work. It will be too hot. In a, in a hot climate like ours, we get a lot of questions like that. We have a lot of questions reserving, uh, revolving around how would it perform in the, in the climate. Now, yeah. uh, now, this is where... Insulation comes in, and you know there, there's so many grades of insulation. We, we, we've, we've looked at them from, from the local ones all the way to the expensive spray foam insulation that you know gives you a, a crazy hour rating. It is, you know, and then we propose this to the customer because, like I said, it's a hand holding process. We try and educate them. They might be interested in it, but then they, they still have their reservations based on their knowledge and what they know about or what it's capable of. So what we sure. try to do is also try yeah. to show it, it's a metal box, but we're going to do this to it, we're going to do that to it to make sure that you don't feel like you're in a metal box. You don't, you don't, you don't see the drawback of utilizing a metal box to do the structure of the building in a hot climate or a cold climate. You know, so there are steps in place. There are mitigations for every risk that comes into building with a, with a container structure. But more importantly, what we try to do is make sure that they, not, they, don't, they don't break the bank. The most important thing is we don't break the bank. We make sure we, we deliver to them a structure that doesn't break the bank. And yeah. when looked at conventionally with uh, normal structures, we, we at least try to be 30% cheaper. 
Ola, let's recap everything that we have been uh, discussing in order to uh, really yeah. contextualize uh, the importance uh, of uh, these thin spaces. So we're talking about structures that are made out of containers and that can yeah. be designed to meet with the brand needs. And course, yeah. that are uh, that can take any uh, type of design, depending, of course, on the limitations of the structure. But they are yeah. fully equipped, and yeah. they are isolated, and uh, they can uh, be uh, put into several locations, even moved from one location to the other. And we really stressed on the importance of placing uh, those spaces into locations such as parking lots or parkings of big shopping malls where there is a lot of uh, customers coming in or an important customer flow uh, in order to uh, draw that value from uh, the space. And we also said that these spaces are good uh, complements uh, for online businesses who need to have a physical appearance, right? Yes. yes. Um, so I think we have a last question that we could take today. Uh, someone is asking about the durability or the lifespan of these living spaces. Yes, so uh, we get this question a lot also. Uh, uh, we, we try and educate. So containers are made of sure. cotton steel, it's a type of steel that is used for shipping and you, you use it on the on the ocean. The, the seawater is caustic, it eats metal. You understand what I'm saying? So basically, uh, this type of metal, it, it, it's that durable that the, the more it rusts, the, the stronger the molecular structure of the metal becomes. Yeah. So this, this property makes it, makes it like a fortress really, like a, a fortress, whatever it is you're building, will be built like a fortress. If it's a small shop, it will be a, a fortress, small shop. You understand what I'm saying? So yeah. it is a very, very durable material. Now, if I look at con uh, conventional structures, you need to build it to brick, you need to plaster off your walls, you need to paint your walls. Now, these are layers of protection that you're giving to the underlying brick so that when the weather comes, it doesn't wither down that brick. The same, the same concept applies to a container. You need to protect it. So it's a metal. So anti-rust anti -rust paint is, your, is, is, a, is a must. Yeah. You, you get what I'm saying? Um, reflective paint to help reduce uh, 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 radi I mean, uh, solar radiation is a must. Uh, you know, cladding, if you must, if you, if you must also helps to, to, to reduce the, the uh, transference of heat. And also, to also beautify the unit. So when it, when it comes to when it comes to um, um, uh, inside and outside, when it comes to you you looking at it from the inside and the outside, there there, there are various layers of protection that you can add to the container right. to make sure that the core container itself does not get affected by the elements or by 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 by, by anything basically. So mm -hmm. you, you you protect the container, you protect just like you would any other structure. So for something like this, you're talking maintenance times of maybe every decade or, you know, every 15 years, you can, like I said, paint or, you know, add a layer of anti -wash. Yes. And just like you would have, yes. You would maintain, I mean, yes. the space. Uh, we have we have talked about the costs uh, earlier when we started the conversation, but uh, someone is asking uh, how would it approximately cost to make a three-room uh, container? The, e so the equivalent... Yeah. Yes, we would normally start with a design. We would start with a design yeah. first because you would like, but we would we could look at this as a single structure or look at it as a, a three-room design as a single structure. Um, in Nigeria, I don't know where, you, where you're calling from, in Nigeria for something like that, you'll be looking at about, about four to five million naira. Now, if you look at the same structure, the same structure in a, in a brick and mortar, you'll be looking at about about six to seven million now. Uh, now this can, is can also, we convert this in uh, US dollars uh, approximately? USD, USD, you know, okay, about about ten thousand dollars, about ten thousand dollars for okay. three bedroom, about ten to twelve thousand for for three bedroom. And for the same cost of a of a of a brick and mortar building, you're looking at about maybe thirteen to about fifteen thousand. 
So there okay. is a bit of a, of a, of a stake, but that will also determine on the level of finishing that the client has. Yes, the detailing that is required uh, from the that, client. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Yes. Ola, thank you. I don't know if we're having any other questions from everyone. I think we had a lot of people jo joining and waving at you today, so thank you. The yeah. discussion has been uh, fruitful and uh, yeah. very interesting. And we invite everyone to, uh, to, to join your Facebook page or your Instagram page because it has it's all the details and uh, all the uh, examples that you have been doing yes. uh, lately. Yes. Thank you yes. so much for your time and for joining me. Thank you so much for inviting us. We appreciate it. Thank you and have a nice weekend. And you too. Ciao. Thank you. Bye. -bye.